قد أفلح المؤمنون أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد Respected Muslim brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Today we're just going to dive right into it We last left off discussing the age of Sayyidah Khadija and Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم when they were married. Today I'm going to go over the children of Sayyidah Khadija alayha, and then we are going to dive into her fadail insha'Allah. The reason why I decided to go over her children's lives uh, now as opposed to at the very end is because the children of Khadija alayha, they highlight a few important facts about her and obviously her children were born before she passed away. So I feel like this would be the best place to go over that. So the first person we're going to go over is Hind ibn Abi Hala. So Hind ibn Abi Hala, we mostly covered him last time. So you're free to go back to that video to see some of the reports that we that we listed regarding him or some, uh, regarding him or some of the ahadith that he narrated. But Hind ibn Abi Hala was Khadija's son from her previous marriage to Abi Hala Tamimi. And he accepted Islam. He became a Muslim and he narrated the appearance of the Prophet وسلم, to his nephew, Imam al-Hasan al-Mujtaba. He was later martyred in Harb al-Jamal while fighting for Amir al-Mu'mineen. May Allah be pleased with him and may Allah be pleased with his effort. The second of Khadija's children is Al-Qasim ibn Muhammad. So Al-Qasim ibn Muhammad is the eldest of Rasulullah's children from whom he gets his famous kunya of Al-Qasim. And he was born during the Jahiliya period. That means he was born before Allah commanded him to begin preaching. He was said to have been about two years old. He was still very young. He was still a toddler when he passed away. And he passed away before the da'wah began. So he was born and he passed away before the da'wah began. The next of Rasulullah's children is Zainab bint Muhammad. Zainab is the eldest daughter of Rasulullah Her biography is actually very, very interesting. It's actually just short enough to where we can go over it here without diverting too much from her mother Khadija. Sayyidah Zainab bint Rasulullah she was his eldest daughter and she married her cousin who was the nephew of Sayyidah Khadija who was Abu al-As ibn al-Rabi'ah. So Abu al-As ibn al-Rabi'ah was the son of Khadija's sister. That means Khadija was his khal. She was his uh, his maternal aunt. And so when Abu al-As wanted to get married, it is narrated that he came to Khadija, salam alayha, asking him, Auntie, I would like you to find me someone to marry. So she told Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa and Rasulullah approved of, of him marrying his daughter Zainab. When they were married, and it is recorded in the books of Ibn Ishaq as well as Ibn Sa'd in his tabaqat. He records that when the Prophet began to preach Islam, Quraysh started to turn against Rasulullah One of the ways they tried to hurt Rasulullah was by trying to sort of cut off his marital ties. So one of the ways they did this was they told the sons-in-law of the Prophet to divorce their wives. So Abu al-As ibn al-Rabi' they told him to divorce Zainab and he refused. He refused to divorce Zainab because he he genuinely loved her and cared for her and nothing Quraysh offered him could convince him to let her go. And he remained a kafir at this time. And so this is a famous example of where the imam, in this case Rasulullah is not obligated to enforce the sharia law if he does not have the power to do so. So Rasulullah, had, the, had he had the power in Mecca to dissolve this marriage, he would have done so. But at the time, he simply could not do that. Uh, and this is something that is even mentioned by, uh, I believe it's mentioned by Aisha, uh, one of the books of the Sia, uh, probably the Sirah of Ibn Ishaq. So Quraysh attempted to convince Abu al-As to divorce her and, and he refused. And so Zainab remained in Mecca with her husband when the Muslims emigrated to Yathrib. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and his sahaba and his family, they migrated to, to Medina, but Zainab could not migrate with them. She had to stay in Mecca. So... Abu al-As ibn Rabi' was later captured at the Battle of Badr. Like he participated in the Battle of Badr on the side of the Kuffar and he was captured. And so his wife Zainab ransomed him using an onyx necklace that had been given to her as a wedding gift by her mother Khadija. So it is said that when Rasulullah saw the necklace, 
he remembered Khadija alayha, and so he refused to accept any cash ransom for his son-in-law. So he sent Abu al-As home. He, he agreed to let Abu al-As go in exchange for this, this necklace, but only on the condition that he would send Zainab to Medina. This is also reported in Tabaqat ibn Sa'ad on page 25 to page 26. So you see that, that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this was the, his way of getting his daughter back, is that he had taken Abu al-As ibn al as a captive, as a hostage, and he agreed. He said, I will let you go, but once you get back to Mecca, you have to send me my daughter. You have to set her free. And so uh, Abu al-As agreed to this. He promised Rasulullah that he would do this. So about a month after the Battle of Badr, Sayyidah Zainab, alayha, the daughter of the Prophet, she was being escorted from Mecca to Medina by her adopted brother, Zayd ibn Haritha. And so this angered Quraysh, the fact that they had lost the Battle of Badr, and now Muhammad seemed to be rubbing it in by taking his daughter away in front of everyone. He was showing everyone that he had won and that he was taking his daughter back. Quraysh, they pursued Zainab and her escort, and they caught up with her at a place named Dutua, right, in Mecca. And so a man by the name of Habar ibn al-Aswad, he threatened her with his lance. And so he, she was sitting on top of a haudaj, which is a box that is typically on a camel. He was threatening her with his lance, and so she fell off her, uh, her camel, and it's said that she fell onto a stone. And at the time, she was pregnant. And so uh, her brother-in-law, Kinana, Kinana ibn Rabi'a, who's the brother of Abu al-As, he defended her, and he threatened to, to fight the Quraysh over this. So Abu Sufyan, la'inahullah, arrived, and he calmed down the situation. He de-escalated it. And so he told them, he said, you know, it is in your best interest not to take her out of the city publicly, because Quraysh will not accept this insult to their honor. And so eventually Zainab was taken home. She was taken to, to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in Medina, and she suffered a miscarriage as a result of, of the actions of Habbar ibn al-Aswad. And this is another example of just Rasulullah's mercy. And this report can be found in, in Tabaqat ibn Sa'ad. It can also be found in the, the life of Muhammad, which is the translation of Ibn Ishaq's seerah. And so this is a great example of Rasulullah's mercy. You see this, this myth of Rasulullah being this bloodthirsty warlord. You know, when Rasulullah conquered Mecca, there was a list of people who had slighted him, who had wronged him. And so Habbar ibn al-Aswad, this man, caused his daughter to miscarry her baby. And Rasulullah, this is one of the people who Rasulullah spared. So he ranks up there with like Wahshi and these other people who had, you know, caused Rasulullah immense personal loss. But Rasulullah forgave them for the sake of, of promoting Islam and for the sake of completing his mission. Shortly after the conquest of Mecca, or shortly before the conquest of Mecca rather, in the year 6, this is in the year 6 after Hijrah is when this event takes place. Abu al-As ibn al-Rabi' is in Mecca and Zainab has, has been... So they have been split apart. Zainab is back in Medina with her family. So Abu al-As ibn al-Rabi' was on his way to Syria, and he was carrying merchandise that he was planning to sell. Uh, and he had also taken the goods of Quraysh. And so after he finished his trade and he was on his way back, he came across one of the Prophet's raiding parties. There are reports that indicate that it was Rasulullah that had sent this, this raiding party. He heard that Abu al-As was taking this caravan, and so he sent Zayd ibn Haritha, with 170 mounted riders, uh, horsemen, uh, mounted raiders. And so in Jumada the first of the year six after Hijrah, this party managed to catch him off guard. And they took all of his stuff, and it is said that he managed to escape. This group returned to Medina with the booty that they had captured. And so Abu al-As ibn al-Rabi'ah, that night he came into Medina, and so he went to Zainab's house. He went to his former wife's house, to Zainab bint Rasulullah. And he asked for her protection. And so she granted him protection as long as he was occupied with retrieving his property. So in the morning when the Prophet came out to pray, when he uttered Allahu Akbar and the people did the same, Zainab called out, O people, I have given protection to Abu al-As ibn al-Rabi'a. This is an interesting point of fiqh. This is a well-known ruling in fiqh, is that when it comes to dealing with the kuffar, every Muslim has the right to offer a, a kafir protection. Muslims can offer the kuffar protection. Say if like we're in the middle of a, a, a raid or in the middle of a conquest, and I see someone from the kuffar who I used to know from back in the day. So I say, you know, he's under my protection. So none of the Muslims can take him captive. None of the Muslims can do him harm. And preferably what I would do is I would call him to Islam. I would urge him to accept Islam. So when the Prophet finished his prayer, he confirmed that, you know, Zainab was in her right to do so, that she had the right to offer this man protection. So he told her that treat him as your guest, but do not let him touch you because you are not lawful to him. 
because Zainab is a Muslim and Abu al-As ibn Rabi' is a non-Muslim. This incident is recorded in Tarif al-Tabari in volume 39 from page 14 to 16 and is also recorded in Tabaqat ibn Sa'ad volume 8 page 27. Abu al-As ibn Rabi' when Zainab had offered him protection what the Prophet essentially did is he asked the people of Medina he said to them would you be so kind as to return my son-in-law's property to him and so they they all did so they all gave Abu al-As all of the goods and so he returned to Mecca so after returning to Mecca he gave back the goods to Quraysh so he told Quraysh have I not been truthful have I not been honest with you I I delivered your goods and I did my best to get them back for you they said yes indeed this is true so he said okay now that you have your goods back and now you have conceded that I am honest and trustworthy I accept that la ilaha illallah and that Muhammad is Rasulullah the, he says to Quraysh he says the reason why I waited to do it until after I got the goods is because I did not want any of the Muslims thinking I was only accepting Islam just to take, just to get my goods back. I remained a kafir and they still gave me the goods back. And now I've delivered them back to you. And now I'm a Muslim. I am free of you. And so then he, he made his way back to Medina. And so when Abu al-As converted to Islam and he returned to Medina, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi restored his marriage to his Sayyidah Zainab and they resumed their married life. They were, they were finally reunited as a, as a Muslim couple. Unfortunately, the story does not have a happy ending because we said these events happened, they transpired in the year 6 after Hijrah. The Sayyidah Zainab alayha, bint Rasulullah, she died in the year 8 after Hijrah due to the complications of that miscarriage that she had suffered. And so this is reported by Tabari in volume 39, page 4, where he affirms that it was indeed these injuries that, that caused her to pass away. She is said to have been washed by Umm Ayman, and by the two Ummahat al Mu'mineen, Soda and Umm Salama. They are the ones who, who washed her body before the burial. And this is reported by Ibn Sa'ad in his Kitab al Tabaqat, volume 8, page 21. Zainab, she passed away only two years later after finally being reunited with her husband as a Muslim couple. And so she was then buried in, in Jannat al Baqiyah. And so it is reported that when Zainab, the daughter of Rasulullah, was, uh, when she passed away, and rather we, we should say she was martyred, uh, salam Allah alayha, Rasulullah, as, uh, at her burial, he said, now join with our virtuous predecessor, Uthman ibn Mad'un. And at this point, the women began to cry, and Umar ibn al-Khattab began attacking them with his whip. And so the Prophet held his hand and said, stop, Umar. Let the women, let them weep. And this is recorded in Al-Hakim's Mustadrak in volume 3, page 210, hadith 4869. So that is the eldest daughter of Khadija, salam alayha. The next in the list is her son, Abdullah al-Tahir. And Abdullah is, is known as Al-Tahir because he was said to have been born during the prophetic mission. So that is the, the, his nickname. Uh, his real name is Abdullah. And so he also died when he was very, very young, much like his, his elder brother al Hasan. It is narrated that when Al-Tahir, Abdullah died, عليه, one of Rasulullah's worst enemies, Al-As ibn Wa'il, he's the father of Amr ibn Al-As, he said, you know, as a way of mocking Rasulullah, he said, Rasul Muhammad is now Eptar. He is now without posterity. So the word Eptar, you know, it comes from the word better. To, better means to cut off or something is cut off. If I say, Hada hadithun mabtur, it means it is cut, right? Or for example, when the poet is talking about Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, he says, Abbas ibn al-Murtaba, jarrad al-Battar. So al-Battar, it it's another name for a sword because it cuts. So this man, this Mal'un was saying to Rasulullah's Eptar because his male lineage has been expired. His son Al-Qasim has passed away and his son, you know, Abdullah has also passed away. Correct. You can imagine how, how painful this would have been for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And so in response to this, to, to this, Allah Azza wa Jal revealed Surah Al-Kawthar. And in Surah Al-Kawthar, there is an ayah that says, Inna shani'aka huwa al-Aptar. And so this is recorded in Ansab al-Ashraf by al-Baladri in volume 1, page 157. And we're, I'm only sticking to the historical sources because if we go into the books of Tafsir, they all practically affirm the same thing. And this is also affirmed in Tafsir al-Qummi, Tafsir Ali ibn Ibrahim al-Qummi, or the Tafsir that is attributed to him. And I've only quoted this because it matches with the primary source. It's reinforced by uh, al-Baladri. So in volume 3, page 1185. So that is the, that, that is al-Tahir. And so, 
Imam al-Baqir عليه, narrates this, this very powerful report regarding his Sayyidah Khadija. He narrates that when Al-Tahir passed away, when Abdullah passed away, Rasulullah he came across Khadija and she was weeping. She had suffered the loss of her, of the, her child. And so, you know, Rasulullah forbade her from weeping. And so she said, yes, O Messenger of Allah, I agree, but I noticed that my milk flowed out, thus I wept. And this is something that is recorded in the books of history, that sometimes when a woman loses a child, her milk will begin flowing out. And so Khadija was saying, so this is the reason why I'm weeping, is because I remembered my, my poor baby child. And so Rasulullah then says to her, would you not agree if you find him standing near the door of paradise, and upon seeing you, he would hold your hand and lead you into paradise, the most clean and fine ones therein? So Rasulullah is, is telling her, it's like, you know, have patience, Khadija, because on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, your children will take you by the hand and they will lead you into Jannah. And so she said, is that how it is? And so Rasulullah said, Allah is most majestic and most honorable. He does not take away the fruits of the heart of his own servant who exercises patience, who praises him and agrees with his decision. Allah, due to his glory and honor, does not cause him any suffering. And this is recorded by Fiqhatul Islam Kulaini in his Kitab al kaf al-Sharif in Volume 3, Book 3, Chapter 80, Hadith Number 7. And we see this is something that it doesn't just apply to say the Khadija Salam Allah Indeed, Al-Qasim wa Tahir will lead her into heaven. Indeed, Al-Muhsin Salam Allah will take his mother Fatima's hand and lead her into heaven. And indeed, uh, Aba Abdullah al Hussein, his son al Radi' will also be there to take him into heaven, inshaAllah. And these reports are very, very sad. They're very heartbreaking. And they highlight, you know, there are people that say that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he did not suffer in the early days of the da'wah. It was mostly his companions. And we say this is not true. Rasulullah suffered immensely, but he never gave up and he persevered. And we ask, you know, we know that Allah will reward him for the highest reward for this, as he will his, his wife, Sayyidah Khadija. Now for the other two daughters of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there is not too much biographical data on them. They are Ruqayya and Umm Kulthum, the two other daughters of Khadija. So we will go over them as well. So Ruqayya bint Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she was first married to Utbah ibn Abi Lahab. So when Tabbat Yada Abi Lahab was revealed, Surat al-Masad was revealed, Abu Lahab ordered his son to divorce her. And so they were divorced without having consummated the marriage. And so later she was married to Uthman ibn Affan, and she died during or around the time of the Battle of Badr in the year two after Hijrah, and she was buried in Jannat al Baqiyah. And her full bio, all that information can be found in Tabaqat ibn Sa'ad, volume 8, page 29 to 30. <clears throat> Imam al Sadiq narrates that when Ruqayyah passed away, Rasulullah stood next to her grave and raised his hands towards the sky as tears flowed from his eyes. So the Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, we have seen you raising your head towards the sky as tears flow, flowed from your eyes. So he said, I asked Allah to give me the exception of the squeezing of the grave for Ruqayya. And this is narrated in Kitab al-Zuhd by uh, Hussein ibn Sa'id, uh, Sa'id al-Awza'i, or al-Ahwazi, So he narrates this report in Kitab al-Zuhd in Book 2, Chapter 16, Hadith Number 4. So he narrates the, the sorrow of Rasulullah over his daughter uh, Ruqayya. Other daughter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi was Umm Kulthum. Umm Kulthum was married to Utayba ibn Abi Lahab. Right? The two brothers married the two sisters. And just as with her sister, when Surat al-Masad was revealed, Abu Lahab la'inahullah ordered his son to divorce her, and she, like her elder sister, was divorced without having consummated her first marriage. So in the year three after Hijrah, she was married to Uthman ibn Affan, and she remained with him until she passed away in the year nine after Hijrah. Asma bint Umais narrates that she is the one who gave her the funeral washing. So this is recorded in Ibn Sa'd's book in volume 8, page 30 to 31. Anas ibn Malik narrates an interesting report. He says, we were in the funeral procession of one of the daughters of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, And this is confirmed to be Um Kulthum by Ibn Sa'd's report. And he was sitting by the side of the grave. I saw his eyes shedding tears. He said, is there anyone amongst you who did not have relations with his wife last night? So a man by the name of Abu Talha replied in the affirmative. And so the Prophet told him to get down in the grave. And so he got down in her grave. And this is reported in Sahih al-Bukhari, Hadith 1285. And I wish to point out something really interesting. How come Uthman did not get down in the grave? So Al-Aini in Umdat al-Qari 
actually go so far as to say that Uthman had been having relations with one of his slaves as his wife lay dying. This is in Umdat al-Qari, volume 8, page 110. And so he says that this was Rasulullah's way of humiliating, of showing people that he, you know, did not care about his daughter, even though he was her spouse. And subhanAllah, this is like, if we had said this, they would say, well, this is just something we fabricated against Uthman, but it's recorded in their own books. Lastly, we arrive at Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra. Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra, we cannot cover her biography, obviously, but there is one report that we need to cite when it comes to her as the youngest daughter of Rasulullah. We say, subhanAllah, Amir al-Mu'mineen was the youngest of his siblings, and Fatima was the youngest of her siblings. So, as for Fatima, and yet they were greater than all of their siblings, as for Fatima bint Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa sallam alayha, she was the youngest of the, of the daughters of Khadija and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. She was the son of the purified man, and the, uh, she was the daughter of the purified man and the daughter of the purified woman, and she was the daughter of the greatest mother, we would say, to walk the earth after herself. And we have already covered parts of her biography and we will continue the rest, inshaAllah. Walhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Shaykh al-Tusi, Shaykh al-Ta'ifa reports in his, in one of his books, and I believe this is his Kitab al ghaybah which is a, a very, very important book when it comes to some of our aqa'id. He narrates that a man by the name of Turk al-Harawi, his name was Budayl ibn Ahmed, asked Sayyidina al Hussein ibn Ruh, who was one of the representatives of the Imam during, uh, of Imam Sahib al-Zaman, Ajallah Faraja, during the minor ghaybah. He said, how many daughters did Rasulullah have? al Hussein ibn Ruh said, four. The inquirer, Turk al-Harawi, asked him, which of them is most superior? So he said, Fatima alayhi salam. So he said, how is it that she is the most superior when she was the youngest and she lived for the least time with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So you think about it, her elder sister Zainab lived longer with Rasulullah. She could have narrated more hadiths, right? <clears throat> so and Hussein ibn Ruh replied, it is because of two qualities which Allah bestowed upon her because of his grace on her and in order to make her status clear to all. Clear to all. It's two points. One is that Fatima is the sole inheritor of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and no son of Rasulullah shared this as they all expired during the lifetime of Rasulullah. Secondly, Allah jalla wa ala placed the progeny of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam only in her and the survival of the generations of the descendants of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa was through her and not through anyone else. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave her these two excellences uh, exclusively due to her precedence in sincerity and because he knew about her, pr her pure intention and her conscience. And so Turk al-Harawi says, I have not seen anyone give a better or more brief and useful reply to this question. This is recorded, as we said, in Kitab al-Ghaybah, Book 1, Chapter 45, Hadith number 9. And so this Hadith is very beneficial to us because I'm not going to go over the issue of, of were the Prophet's daughters adopted or were they his real daughters. نَحْنُ نَقُولْ كَمَا قَالْ سَلَفُنَا الصَّالِحِ نَحْنُ نَقُولْ كَمَا قَالْ الْحُسَيْنِ بْنُ رُوحِ رُوَ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى عَلَيْهِ Hussein ibn Ruh was the Imam's representative. And he would not give an answer without the the approval of the Imams. So he says four. He does not say Raba'ib. He does not say anything about Hale. He does not say anything about them being adopted, whatever. He says the Prophet had four daughters, and the, superior, the most superior of them is Fatima. Correct? And all praise is due to Allah, the Lord of all the worlds. Now, let us go over some of the Fadail of Khadija, if time permits us, now that we have given our due to her daughters and to her children. So the first of the merits of Khadija that is, that is very important, one of her khasa'is that none of the other wives of the Prophet had is that Rasulullah did not marry another spouse in Khadija's lifetime. And this is recorded in Kitab al-Kafi in volume 5, book 3, chapter 55. And the chapter is about women lawful in marriage for Rasulullah. And it's hadith number 6. And this is well known. This is a hadith from our Imam alayhi salam confirming something that, that we know from the books of history is that Rasulullah did not take another wife while he was married to Khadija. When he was married to Aisha, he had other wives. When he was married to Um Salama, he had other wives. When he was married to Soda, when he was married to Safiya, when he was married to Raihana, he, he had other wives, he had other spouse, correct? Or spouses. So another of the fawa'il of Sayyidah Khadija alayha, is when Allah commanded Rasulullah to begin his mission. 
to begin preaching Islam, he kept it secret and he played it close to the chest. You know, and for many years, you know, the reports say that there, uh, I believe it was three years, Islam was kept very, very secret. As in the number of Muslims, the Muslim Ummah was no more than the fingers on both of your hands. So the only Muslims at the time were who? Were Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, were Khadija sallallahu alayhi, and they were Amir al Minin sallallahu alayhi. And this is reported in Al Kafi. Someone asked Imam al Bata sallallahu alayhi, he said, Ya Abu Ja'far, the Imam tells this man, he says, Oh Abu Ja'far, this was a special matter. Common people are not able to hear it. The Imam said, Allah disdains not being worshipped in secrecy until the, the time comes to when his religion becomes public. It is just as Rasulullah and Khadija would not make their religion public until they were commanded to do so. The man asking the question, who's asking the Imam this question, he says, is it proper for the author of this religion to hide? And this is a shubha that the Mukhalifin bring up to this day. It's such a dumb shubha. Like, you know, why does the Imam keep his matter secret? Why does it the Imam go public? Why does he need to do taqiyya? So the Imam responds, he says, Did Ali ibn Abi Talib عليه, not hide his religion on the day he became Muslim with the Messenger of Allah until his matter became public? He said, yes, that was the case. The Imam said, so also is our cause, the publicity of the divine authority until the appointed time will come. So Khadija عليه, has that distinction, has that honor of being, you know, at a time... <laughs> Thulth al-Islam. She was the, the, the one-third of Islam. It was her, her husband, and Ali salam Shaykh al-Tusi rahimahullah reported on the authority of Sayyiduna Ja'far ibn Muhammad al-Sadiq alayhi salam that he said that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kept his prophethood concealed for five years and remained underground due to fear. He did not publicize his message whereas Ali alayhi salam and Sayyidah Khadija salam alayha were present with him. After that, Allah Jalla wa ala commanded him to announce that which he had been offered and to publicize his messengership. Al-Tabarani also reported that Malik uh, ibn Hawayrat said, the first man to embrace Islam was Ali, and among the women it was Khadija. And this is reported in Al-Mu'jam al-Kabir, volume 19, page 291, hadith 648. Al-Bazar in his Musnad also reported this on the authority of Abu Rafi, Radwanlahi Ta'ala, ta who was one of the freedmen of Rasulullah. And this is in Musnad al bazar volume 9, page 322, hadith 3872. So they report that the first of the men, the first male to accept Islam was Ali, and the first woman to accept Islam was Khadija. If someone asks the question, he says, Well, who accepted it first between Ali and Khadija? According to the narrations of the Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salam, and we'll go over this inshallah when we cover you know, the issue of the first Muslim with regards to Ali versus Abu Bakr. The narrations of the Ahlul Bayt are almost unanimous that Ali accepted Islam first. correct? And this is one of the fada'il of Amir al-Mu'mini. But Khadija is the first among the women. She is the first woman to, woman to accept Islam. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud has a very interesting report regarding this. He narrates, he says, The first thing I learned about the matter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi was when I came to Mecca for general purposes. We were directed to Al-Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, who was the Prophet's uncle, and he was sitting near the Zamzam area. While we were with Al-Abbas, a man approached from the Safa gate. This man had a striking appearance. He was white with a reddish complexion, had a luxuriant beard, curly hair, a prominent nose, a broad forehead, distinctively spaced eyes, a full beard, and fine hair on his arms. He was, a com he was accompanied by a young man and a woman. And the report says that this young man, this is how Ibn Mas'ud describes him. He says that this man was Amrad. He was very young. He didn't even have a beard yet. Describing Rasulullah, he said, The man who appeared like the full moon on the night of Badr walked on the right side, and the young man was on his right, while the woman was behind them veiling her beauty. And Ibn Mas'ud notes this, like this is during Jahiliyyah. Like, you know, we have reports to say people back then used to perform Hajj while they were naked. So he took notice of the fact, like this woman was veiling herself. And so this is obviously say the Khadija salam alayha. They performed tawaf around the Kaaba seven times. And during their worship, they made long supplications, bowing and prostrating with the young man and the woman following their leader's actions. So Rasulullah would lead them. And Khadija salam alayhi, and Imam Ali salam alayhi, would follow his, his actions. The people witnessing this event, include Ibn Mas including Ibn Mas'ud, they found this unfamiliar. It's like the way that, that this man is worshipping is very unusual. So Ibn Mas'ud says they approached Al-Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib 
and asked if something new had occurred. So Al-Abbas explained to them that this man was the son of his nephew Muhammad ibn Abdullah. But rather, this man was his nephew, the son of his brother. And the other young man was his other nephew, Ali ibn Abi Talib, and the woman was, his, was Muhammad's wife, Khadija ibn Khuwaylid. Al-Abbas emphasized that no one on the face of the earth worshipped Allah with this religion except for these three individuals. And so this report is narrated in Al-Mu'jam Al-Kabir by Al-Tabarani in volume 10, page two, uh, 226 to 227, hadith 10,397. It was weakened by Al-Haythami in Majma' Al-Zawa'id, volume 9, page 261 to 262, hadith 15, uh, 15,267. And Al-Haythami comments, he says, you know, even though this chain is da'if, it is corroborated by another report. It is corroborated by the report of Afif al-Kindi, which is a very, very well-known report. Afif al-Kindi was the uncle of Al-Ash'ath ibn Qais. And he was from Yemen. He also came to Mecca and he saw the same thing. He notes, he says, I saw these three people praying. And he adds the line, he says, and how I wish I had accepted Islam on that day. Because if I did, I would have been the fourth Muslim. So this is the very, very beginning of the Muslim Ummah. The Muslim Ummah in its infancy, when it was only, how many people? Only three people. There is a report regarding Khadija and Rasulullah sallallahu that I wish to go over. When it comes to, you know, so it's often narrated, it's often brought up. So it is narrated that when Rasulullah sallallahu when he first saw Jibra'il, he doubted his own sanity and he complained to Khadija. And so this report has been narrated by Ibn Abbas and it's also been narrated on the authority of Aisha. And it is rejected due to its munkar content. Firstly, the report of Ibn Abbas is found in Ansab al-Ashraf in volume 1, page 115 to 116. And it comes by way of Dawood ibn al-Husayn, who narrates it from Ikrimah from Ibn Abbas. And both Dawood ibn al-Husayn and Ikrimah were very well known for being khawarij. So and this is just another example of the mukhalifin, you know, because they have no salaf, because there were no ahl sunnah at the time, they have to take from anyone. As for Aisha's report, this comes by way of uh, Az-Zuhri, I believe, from Urwa. From his, uh, from his aunt Aisha. And we, much like Dawood ibn al-Husayn, as well as Ikrima, we consider Aisha to be a liar, and so her words are worth nothing to us. Um, especially when it, it does ta'an of Rasulullah's nabuwa. And this is the same report, by the way, which says that the Prophet was contemplating suicide. Billah. And so this report is very, very munkar. And it's so munkar that even the mukhalifin, despite this hadith being in their most sahih book, they try to play games with the rijal and try to argue that this report is, is rejected. Another infamous report that the enemies of Islam will quote regarding Khadija is that she once said to Rasulullah, O oh son of my uncle, can you tell me when your companion, referring to Jibra'il alayhi salam, comes to you? So when Jibra'il came to him, Rasulullah said, O oh Khadija, this is Jibra'il who has come to me. She said, Rise up, O oh son of my uncle, and sit on my right thigh. He did so. She then asked if he could see Jibra'il, and he replied, Yes. She then asked him to move to her left thigh, and he did again. And so she asked him if he could still see Jibra'il, and he said yes. She then asked for him to sit in her lap, and he did. And once more, he, she asked if he could see Jibra'il. This time, he said no. Khadija then removed her veil, and she bared her chest, asking him, Do you see him now? And he replied no. So she said, Rejoice, for by Allah, he is an angel and not a devil. And this report can be found in Al-Isti'ab on page 889 to page 890. And th this report it is chainless. It's completely chainless, and the content is rep reprehensible, and thus we reject it. And this is just another example, dear brothers. The reason why we mention these things is, number one, because you will see the kuffar will use these reports to try to attack Islam. And number two is to highlight how the mukhalifin, if such a thing was narrated about Aisha, they would lose their minds. But if you're literally using Khadija to make a mockery of the Prophet, it's completely acceptable. It's completely acceptable to include these sorts of reports in the books of the seerah. And we seek refuge in Allah from such nonsense. And we curse the one who fabricated such stories. Now when it comes to the fada'il of a Sayyidah Khadija, alayha, Khadija, one of her most famous fada'il, is narrated by Anas ibn Malik. And he reports that Rasulullah said, The most excellent of the women of all the worlds are Maryam, the daughter of Imran, Khadija, the daughter of Khuwailid, and Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and Asiya, the wife of Fir'aun. And this is reported in Musnad Ahmad ibn Hanbal in volume 19, page 383, hadith 12,414. Ibn Abbas also narrates that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa made four lines on the earth, 
and then he asked his companions, Do you know what this is? So they replied, Allah and his messenger know best. He replied, The most excellent of the women of paradise are Khadija, the daughter of Khuwailid, Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad, Asiya, the wife of Fir'aun, and Maryam, the daughter of Imran. And so this report is also included in Musnad Ahmed ibn Hanbal, but this is in volume 1, page 293, hadith 2668. Notice how Aisha is not on the list. Rather, Khadija and her daughter are on the list, but Aisha is not on the list. And subhanAllah, who do our opponents take most of their hadith from? They left the hadith of, of Khadija and, and Fatima and instead ran after the, the hadith of Aisha. Abdullah ibn Ja'far al-Tayyar narrated that once in Al-Kufa, he heard his uncle Ali عليه, narrate that Rasulullah said, Maryam, the daughter of Imran عليها, was the best among the women of the world of her time, and Khadija is the best among the women of this nation. And this report is very, very well attested. It is in Sahih al-Bukhari, hadith 3432, as well as 3815. And Sahih Muslim Hadith 2430. Another famous fadila of Sayyidah Khadija alayha, is reported by Abu Huraira. He met, uh, reports that Jibra'il once came to Rasulullah. And so he said to Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, Khadija is coming to you with a vessel of seasoned food and drink. When she comes to you, offer her greetings from her Lord, the exalted and the glorious, and on my behalf, and give her glad tidings of a palace of jewels in paradise, wherein there is no noise and no toil. And this report is also uh, reported by Bukhari in two different places in his book, Hadith 3820, as well as 7497, and is also in Sahih Muslim, Hadith 2432. And this is a very important fadila, is that, Jibra'il does not speak without the permission of Allah. He is the exclusive messenger from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to his messenger Muhammad. And so the fact that he would descend to tell Rasulullah, tell Khadija Allah sends his salam, and that I send my salam, and that I promise her a palace in Jannah. This is a very, very powerful manqaba for Sayyidah Khadija. So, we see that when you have fada'il like this, of course, there have to be things fabricated. So once again, there's another report that we have to refute. And this, this report is very interesting because it's about Surat al-Duha. And in the books of the Mukhalifin, these the, the role that Khadija plays here is a negative one. But in the books of the Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salam, you will see that th this is actually a positive report. Correct? So it is narrated in Kitab uh, Tafsir al-Tabari as well as some of the other books, reported in Tafsir al-Tabari and Asbab al-Nuzul by al-Wahidi, as well as uh, al-Mustalak ala sahihain it is reported that at one point the Wahi for Rasulullah, it stopped. And this is a very, very important episode in the seerah, is that the Wahi stopped. So Jibra'il stopped coming to Rasulullah. So when this happened, Rasulullah became very, very sad. Because Rasulullah loves when Jibra'il comes to him. He loves when he receives new Qur'an. When the wahi stops, Rasulullah became sad. And so it is narrated by Arwa ibn Zubair, who is, is well known as an enemy of Amir al-Mu'mineen and an enemy of, of the Ahlul Bayt. And there are even reports in the books of the Mukhalifin that Imam Zain al-Abideen attacked him for the things he would fa fabricate to lessen the status of his mother Fatima to Zahra. He narrates that Jibra'il was late in coming to the Prophet, and this caused him tremendous distress. So Khadija said to him, your Lord has forsaken you because of the distress he sees in you. So Khadija is, is basically made to have told Rasulullah, it's like, look, it looks like Allah has abandoned you. It's all your fault. This is why Allah has abandoned you. And so Allah revealed Surah Al-Duha. Correct? This report is clearly a fabrication. For neither Urwa nor his aunt Aisha were present when Surah Al-Duha were revealed. I don't think Aisha had even been born yet. And so this is report is one that we would, we would clearly reject. So to quote the sources for it, this is Asbab al-Nuzul by al-Wahidi, page 482. It's al-Mustadak al al-Sahihayn, volume 2, page 667, hadith 4214, as well as in Tafsir al-Tabari, volume 24, page 387. Now, let's see what Ibn Abbas has to say about this verse. 
Abaya, who's a very famous early narrator. He's a narrator that the Mukhalifin really, really hate because he narrated a hadith from Imam Ali which indicates the belief of Raj'ah. He says that, I once asked Ibn Abbas about the verse, he found, did he not find you an orphan and give you refuge? So he's asking Ibn Abbas about the tafsir of Surah al duha So Ibn Abbas replied, he was only named an orphan because he did not have any equal on the face of the earth from the first, neither from the last. To which Allah Azza wa Jal, bestowing favor upon him, said, Did he not find you an orphan and give you refuge? Meaning he found you lonely, there is no equal to you, and then he gave the people refuge towards you and made them know your virtue until they came to know you. And then he goes over the next ayah, and then he found you astray. He is saying, among your people, you were attributed to aberration. And so he guided them to knowing you. So he says, It doesn't mean Rasulullah was actually misguided. Rather, it means the people saw you as misguided. The people thought you were one of them. But then through the message of Islam, they were made to recognize that you were always a monotheist. And he found you poor. And this is where Sayyidah Khadija comes in. Right? And he found you poor. And again, this is we're just going through Surah al duha verse by verse. And this is uh, the eighth ayah of Surah al duha So it says, He found you poor and he enriched you. Rather, he is saying, Poor according to your people as they say you have no money. And then Allah enriched you with the money of Khadija. And he increased you from his favor and made your prayer responded to that even if you were to supplicate that a stone is made by Allah into gold, he would achieve your wish. And he brought to you food as there was no food, and he brought to you water as there was no water. And these miracles of Rasulullah are well recorded. Sayyidina Jabir ibn Abdullah records how Rasulullah used to multiply food. And this is also recorded by Sayyidina Fatima al-Zahra. The Sahaba, many of them attest to when they would go on campaigns into the desert, Rasulullah, one of his miracles is he would stick his fingers into the ground and water would come out. And he succored you with angels as there was no succor, and he granted you victory over your enemies. And this tafsir of these verses is narrated by, reported by Shaykh al Saduq in Ma'an al Akhbar, Book 1, Chapter 27, Hadith number 4. And so, regarding his Sayyidah Khadija, you know, subhanAllah, for Surah al Duha, the tafsir that their salaf gives them paints her in a negative light. The tafsir that we have, what does it say? It shows that Khadija, salam alayha, not only was there nothing negative revealed about her, but rather Allah enriched his messenger through her. And subhanAllah, it really breaks your heart when you see the way her daughter Fatima was treated afterward. The, the daughter of Khadija, who gave up everything she had, all the wealth she had, for the sake of Islam, later they deprive her of her, her wealth. Abu Rafi, the, the companion of Rasulullah, he reports that Rasulullah said, and this is narrated in that long report in Amali Shaykh al Tusi, which we previously referred to. The hadith of Abu Rafi, Hind ibn Abi Hala, and Ammar ibn Yasir. Abu Rafi reports that Rasulullah once said, No wealth has ever benefited me as much as Khadija's wealth. He further reports that Rasulullah, he used to free slaves. He used to provide for the poor among his companions while he was in Mecca. He used to bear the expenses of the needy among them and to give to those who sought his help. And when the Quraysh would send their caravans on the two journeys to Levant and Yemen, the winter journey and the summer journey, a portion of the caravans belonged to Khadija. And she had the most wealth among the Quraysh. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam spent from her wealth as he wished during her lifetime. And after her death, he and her children inherited her wealth. Everything she had, that monstrous fortune that she had, that all of Quraysh had their eye on, it all belonged to one man. It belonged to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And people dare say that there was a woman who benefited Islam as much as Khadija sallallahu alayhi wa Even Aisha narrates this. SubhanAllah, what I've seen, there is a, a clip of Uthman al-Khamis. We'll try to throw it up on the screen for you guys. Where he basically says, he says, this idea that Khadija gave up her wealth from Islam is a myth. Because there are hadith that the Mukhalifin have in Sunan ibn Majah and Sunan al-Tirmidhi where the Prophet supposedly said, like, no wealth benefited me as much as Abu Bakr's wealth. So he says, it's a myth. It wasn't Khadija's wealth who helped Islam. It was, uh, it was Abu Bakr's. 
من قال هذا؟ الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول ما نفعني الله بمال كما نفعني بمال ابي بكر، من قال الرسول كان ياخذ من خديجه؟ ما كان ياخذ منها، من قال انك تصرف على الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم؟ هذا كلام خطا اول شيء. In order to refute this nonsense, let's quote the words of Abu Bakr's own daughter. Aisha narrated that when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned Khadija, he spoke highly of her and he praised her. And so Aisha said, one day I felt jealous and said, you often mention her, although she was just a red woman with disheveled hair. This is reported in Sahih al-Bukhari, hadith 3821, and is also reported in Sahih Muslim, Hadith 2437. Furthermore, if you look closely at the hadith, you know, uh, it says that Aisha describes Khadija with the following words. Why do you remember one of those old women of the Quraysh with gums that were red, who is long dead while Allah has given you a better one in her stead? As in, by the way, this is something I want people to keep in mind when it comes to like narrating hadith and that sort of thing. How can you accept the narrations of someone who lies to Rasulullah's face? who will lie about Rasulullah, will lie about Allah Azza wa Jal. Claim that Allah gave a wife better than Khadija. If she's shameless enough to lie to Rasulullah, what makes you think she's being honest with you? So Khadija, salam alayha, this is the way Aisha describes her. How did the Prophet react? The Prophet replied, Allah did not give me better than her. She believed in me when the people disbelieved in me. She testified to my truth when the people accused me of lying. And she supported me with her wealth when people deprived me. What are you talking about? Abu Bakr's wealth benefited Rasulullah. She supported me with her wealth when people deprived me. And Allah blessed me with children through her while, we, while he withheld children from the other wives. And this report can be found in Musnad Ahmed ibn Hanbal, volume 41, page 356 to page 358, hadith 24,864. It has also been reported by Aisha, like, subhanAllah, you cannot make these things up. Aisha also reports that when she said this to the Prophet, he became so upset that the tips of her hair began, of his hair began to shake. As in, he was so upset that the hair on his head began to shake, it began to tremble. That's how upset he was when he heard Aisha say these words. And this is reported in Al-Mu'jam Al-Kabir by Tabarani in volume 23, page 11 and 13. It's hadith uh, 14 as well as 21 to 22 with 14 and 21 being graded Hassan by Al-Haythami in Majma' al-Zawad. And he graded these hadiths in Majma' al-Zawad, volume 9, page 264 to page 265. You can also see Al-Ajri's Kitab al-Shari'a in volume 5, uh, page 2193 to page 2194, as well as Al-Isti'ab. And the Mukhalifin will narrate these things from Aisha as though this in no way demeans her status but rather it's simply, it's, it's just a fadila for Khadija. Yes, it is a fadila for Khadija. Absolutely. It's a refutation of the fadail of your salaf and also shows you what kind of a spouse Aisha was. And now, inshallah, and we will wrap up with this, we'll go over the, the death of a Sayyidah Khadija. When Quraysh boycotted Bani Hashim, this is a famous episode from the Sirah of the Prophet. When they boycotted Bani Hashim and they forced them to live for three years in the Shu'ab of Abi Talib, and this boycott it began in year 7 before the Hijrah and it ended in the year 10 before the Hijrah. So for 7 years, Rasulullah and Bani Hashim were being besieged by, uh, by Quraysh. And I just want to ask, like this is something interesting. Uh, Jahil, I think even Ibn Taymiyyah echoes the same argument. So you know, how can Ali's Islam be beneficial when he was only a child? He not, didn't have to suffer for the sake of Islam. Abu Bakr and... and Bilal and these other people were suffering, they were being tortured. But Ali was not being tortured. We say to him, Ya Jahil, Allah, we should change your name from Jahil to Jahil. Ya Jahil, that argument would apply to Rasulullah as well. If you're claiming that Ali was not suffering for the sake of Islam, what about Rasulullah? Sallallahu Alaihi wa Rasulullah, they never tortured him. Sure, they harassed him and they insulted him, correct? With Ali, Sallallahu Alaihi wa him and Khadija suffered in the Shu'ib of Abi Talib for three years. Three years, this boycott that they instituted against Bani Hashim. No one was allowed to sell them food. No one was allowed to trade clothing or any materials with them. No one was allowed to give them or to take from them in marriage. They tried to strangle Islam in its infancy. And the people who deserve the most credit for saving it in that time were Khadija and Abu Talib. Khadija and Abu Talib spent everything they had 
to keep Islam alive. And this is reported in a Qutb al-Din al-Rawandi's Kharaj wal Jara'ih in volume 1, page 85, in report 181. When he's talking about the miracle of Rasulullah, the way he, the, he managed to break the boycott. The situation became so severe that Khadija's nephew, Hakim ibn Hizam, was forced to smuggle food to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa as well as to his own aunt Khadija in the valley. And this is recorded by Ibn, Is- uh, Ibn Hisham in his rendition of the seerah in volume 2, page 8. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I wish I had the time to narrate this entire story, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent forth the termites to destroy the contract upon which Quraysh had written the agreement for the boycott. Thus the boycott came to an end, and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and his clan were finally allowed to return to Medina. Now we go over what historians commonly call Am al or the year of sorrow. This is the last year of, of Khadija's life. Am al there is no hadith where Rasulullah calls this year Am al Rather, it seems to be a name that later historians gave to this year. To describe the sorrow that Rasulullah felt at the loss of, of two of his most important allies, his uncle Abu Talib alayhi, and Sayyidah Khadija. This year occurs three years before the Hijrah, three years before Rasulullah migrated. As in SubhanAllah, what a difficult three years that must have been. As in Rasulullah was in Mecca and he no longer had Abu Talib, he no longer had Khadija. For three years, he was in what we would call hostile territory before he was finally able to migrate to Medina. Khadija alayha, was at this point, she was 65 years of age and she is reported to have died in the month of Ramadan with some reports saying that she died three days after Abu Talib and may Allah have mercy on them both. And this is recorded by Ibn Sa'ad in his biography in volume 8, I believe this is a biography of Khadija, volume 8, page 1415, as well as Ibn Abdul Bar and Al-Isti'ab, page 892. So within three days, the Prophet lost both Abu Talib and he lost both Khadija. It is reported that when Khadija was on her deathbed, the Prophet is said to have said to her, I see that you are tired, and perhaps Allah will make this fatigue a source of great good. When you meet my companions in paradise, convey, convey my greetings to them, Ya Khadija. And so Khadija is reported to have said to the Prophet, and this entire report is reported by Liaqubi, rahimahullah, who's one of our early historians. He said, Who are they, Ya Rasulullah? Who are your companions in paradise? So he replied, Allah has married you to me in paradise. And he has also married Maryam, the daughter of Imran, and Asya, the daughter of Muzahim, and Kul, uh, Kulthum, the sister of Musa, salam These are my these these are the women who Allah, according to this report, Allah married them to Rasulullah in Jannah. And this is also reported in the books of Mukhalifin with multiple chains that are da'if. So Allah alam, if this is true, it would appear to have a certain level of tawatr. And so Khadija is reported to have said with comfort and with children. And this is what you say to a newlywed. And so we see even on her deathbed, Khadija alayha, showed no signs of jealousy. Rather, she congratulates Rasulullah alayhi And so Khadija alayha, when she passed away, it is reported, this is reported by both al Yaqubi in the same report, as well as in the Amali of Shaykh Al-Tusi alayhi, and we covered this previously in our biography of Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra alayha. It said that Fatima clung to Rasulullah weeping and she kept asking him, Father, where is my mother? Where is my mother? And at this point, Jibra'il al-Amin came down and said, Tell Fatima that Allah has prepared a house for her mother in paradise, a house made of single hollow pearl, neither noisy nor tiring. In the Amali of Shaykh Al-Tusi, he, he reports with a, a sort of different wording and is worth mentioning. It says that when Rasulullah said this to Fatima, salam alayha, she replied, Inna Allah huwa salam, wa minhu salam, wa ilayhi salam. This is how she replies to the salam of Allah and Jibra'il al-Amin, salam alayhi. According to Khadija's nephew, once again citing Hakim ibn Hizam, Khadija, salam alayha, was buried by the Prophet himself in the Hajun Cemetery in Mecca. And this is the this report is also included by Ibn Sa'd in his Kitab al-Tabaqat. And so this Cemetery, the Hajun Cemetery, is, I believe it goes by another name, it's also called uh, the uh, Mu'allat Cemetery. And so this is where Abu Talib is buried, this is where Khadija, or uh, Jannat al-Mu'alla, 
So Jannat al baqiyah the cemetery of Baqiyah, Jannat al Mu'alla, the Mu'alla cemetery. It is where Khadija alayha, and Abu Talib are buried. It is also where Abdul Muttalib alayha, I believe this is also where he's buried, where the children of Rasulullah, his two boys, are buried. And so Khadija, alayha, she passed away long before the battles. She passed away before the conquest movement. She passed away before Rasulullah became, you know, we, we'd say the, before the phase of Islam where Rasulullah became a powerful ruler. Correct? Where he have finally had the might to confront his enemies and to avenge the, the kufr that they had committed against Allah, the blasphemy that they had committed against Allah. And Rasulullah, as we know, he became immensely wealthy during, the, during this time. But none of it would have been possible without Khadija. Ali alayhi, was still very young at the time. And we know Ali and the other companions of Rasulullah, many of them would do, render their services to Islam on the battlefield. Others would render their service to Islam through their you know, serving as diplomats, through their serving as, as messengers of the messengers of Rasulullah to their own clans. But none of it would have been possible without Khadija. None of the mosques, none of the domes, none of the minarets. Correct? None of the massive jama'as that we see every year when the Muslims gather together to pray. Not a single person converts to Islam without Khadija alayha, receiving some of the credit, without her receiving some of the sadaqah jariyah. And so we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, bihaq Khadija, faraj anna, Ya Allah. Allahumma bihaq Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad, grant us the opportunity to visit Sayyidah Khadija alayha. Allow us to visit her, allow us to rebuild her grave, allow us to honor her legacy. And we declare our bara'ah from those who have slandered to say the Khadija, Salamullah alayha, who have shown enmity to us on account of us favoring Khadija the same way that your Prophet did. My dear brothers and sisters, I ask you, there is a certain, some of your brothers and sisters from among the believers, particularly one of the sisters, is asking for your du'a. We dedicate the thawab of these majalis regarding Sayyidah Khadija to her, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to ease her burden. We ask Allah to ease all of our burdens. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, bihaq Khadija salamullahi alayha, to grant us the honor of hajj to his sacred house, and to grant us the honor of one day witnessing the, the victory of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. as we enter paradise with him, as we see a Sayyidah Khadija, we see our Salaf al-Salih. And we'll end this majlis with Surah Al-Fatiha, tasbiquha salatu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad.